Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Stephen Boyd from Stanford University. Uh, Stephen is uh, the Samsung Professor of Engineering and a Professor of uh, Electrical Engineering uh, in the Information System Lab at Stanford. Uh, he has done very influential work on convex augmentation and uh, pioneered uh, convex augmentation in many application areas such as uh, control theory control systems, signal processing, and uh, circuit design. Uh, okay, today he's going to talk about some uh, recent advances of uh, convex augmentation. Stephen? Great. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I'm, I, I, I gather I'm finishing off a uh, uh, Stanford week here or something like that. So. <laughs> but we, we didn't plan it. So. Um, but anyway, I'm, happy, I'm very happy to uh, finish up um, uh, Stanford week at, at, at MSR. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, recent advances in convex optimization. Um, I'll Stop me any time. I'll, I'll definitely have parts. I'll go too fast. If I go too slow, that's, that's really criminal, at which point you, you should just speed me up somehow or make the universal sign of boredom or whatever, and I'll, I, I will speed up. Um, but I have a lot of material, though, so you can, uh, we'll, we'll just see. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, start uh, by just quickly saying what convex optimization is and, and why anyone would care about it. Um, then the things I want to, uh, I'll talk about, I'll really talk about three different things. I mean, in different levels of detail, actually, in none of them in, in horrible detail. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about, um, and these are, I guess, the recent advances. Uh, one is modeling tools for convex optimization. So I'll, I'll, I'll say what these are, how they work, uh, what do you do with them, and things like that. I'll talk about that. Um, this has had uh, a, a huge impact. On, on sort of how teaching is done and research is done uh, with, with these things. Um, I'll talk um, briefly about large-scale convex optimization, which beyond beyond problem scales and sizes where a direct solver can work and you move to iterative solvers. So this, this is when you move into the million and 10 million variable, 10 million constraint type, type ranges. Um, and the final thing I'm going to talk about is something I'm, I'm quite interested in right now. Um, and it's kind of, I'll, I'll say a little bit about some preliminary work. Actually, what's, what's there is, uh, I have very little on this, but I'll talk about it. Um, and we actually, this is sort of ongoing work, uh, and I'll maybe, if, if I still have time, uh, we'll talk, I'll say a little bit about some of the, the ongoing work. Real-time convex optimization is embedding convex optimization methods um, in extremely fast real-time uh, systems. So we're talking about solving convex optimization problems of modest size in numbers like microseconds or milliseconds. We'll talk about this. Um, but I, I, I can tell you the summary right now. You can do it. So that's the summary. Um, so, but we'll get to that. It's actually quite interesting because for this, for this one, it opens up this whole world uh, because people who do optimization, if you're trained in optimization, if you do, even the people who make all the best solvers and stuff like that, they're always talking about, oh, I solved this problem with a million variables and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but these are like human time scales. Um, I, I actually have this thing now where I just ask people who write solvers, how fast can you solve like a network flow, you know, some small or some tiny uh, problem with, uh, you know, a couple of hundred variables or something like that. They, basically, they don't know. They're like a second. Or, if, it's, if it's fast enough that like an Excel spreadsheet update, it's not seen in, um, they call that zero. Okay. Uh, but the answer, is, uh, the answer is a lot of those things, if you know what you're doing, can be solved in microseconds and milliseconds. And we'll see some, I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples of that. So I have no idea what to do with this. I have some ideas, but we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Now I should say interrupt me at any time. All right. So we'll start with optimization. I think everybody would know all about this, but just to set, set the notation. Um, you minimize an objective function subject to some um, inequality constraints and some equality constraints. And... You know, everything is an optimization problem. Well, fine. That's, uh, that's, that's a tautology. It says nothing. Um, what really matters is whether or not you can solve that problem. Um, and whether or not you can solve it depends very much 
on the properties of these functions. Um, so for example, if they're all linear plus a constant or affine, you get an LP, and these you can solve very efficiently. So, and I mean in generic cases. I'm not talking about something where it's a you know, million vari I mean, you can always push the boundary, and things get difficult there, and you need custom methods and all that. But roughly speaking, as a zeroth order statement, you can say you can solve LPs very efficiently. Um, now in contrast, uh, very small problems of that form with nonlinear um, FI uh, and HI, so nonlinear functions involved there, these can be intractable. That, it's very easy to write to, to, to make a small, if you just go to quadratic, that's all you need, and you can embed your favorite uh, NP-complete problem uh, this way, and then that's, that's the end of that. And then these will actually be difficult in practice as well. Okay. Convex optimization is this. Uh, your, equality con your equality constraints are all affine, or linear, I guess people would say. Um, the and the objective and the inequality constraint functions are convex. So they're, the graph is, is, is bowl-shaped, and they have positive curvature. Um, so that's convex optimization. And it's a subclass, you know, it, it includes LP as a special case. LP is, the, is the, actually a the special case with a zero curvature. So LP is the case when all the functions are affine, and uh, that means that you have an equality here, and not just for theta between zero and one, but for all theta. So that's, that's affine, okay? Um, so that's the, the boundary of convex, of convex optimization problems, in some sense, are LPs. So that's what they are. Um, now these things can look really difficult. They can be nonlinear, they're non-differentiable, and so on, uh, but they can be solved very efficiently. So, and I should point out that that's something that goes against much of the teaching and thinking um, in, in OR, in, in traditional uh, optimization and, op you know, because they focus, I mean, in traditional optimization, they talk, you talk about linear and then, they, then you go to nonlinear. They even organize themselves this way with you do LP or you do NLP and NLP is nonlinear, something like this. And then a further step would be, you know, non-differentiable nonlinear and that's, you know, a big step up and then you could go to discrete or whatever or something like this. Um, but it turns out when you're talking about convexity, uh, differentiability is totally irrelevant. Nothing, I mean, just utterly irrelevant. Uh, so, which is not, if you go look at your traditional first class on optimization, since the entire book is filled with like, the first half of the book is filled with gradients, and the second half is filled with gradients and Hessians, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, it, this, is not a, this is not a small issue in traditional uh, OR. It's a big deal. Okay, so, all right. Um, second big point is that uh, these problems come up a whole lot more often than was once thought. So, um, you know, I guess uh, LP is widely used, widely suffused into lots of areas. Um, but it turns out there's a lot more problems that are convex that hadn't been noticed to be convex. Um, now, I mean, there's a very large number of these. Um, and and, and it, it's one of these positive feedback systems. It's a social uh, system where the more people know about these things, I mean, the more people, for example, who know about semi-definite programming and are out there looking at real problems, you know, the more people step back one day and say, oh my God, that's, a, that, that's an SDP or something like that. So, I mean, and the more applications there are of SDP, for example, the more motivation there is for people to write good solvers for it and work out complexity theory and all that kind of stuff. So, so, so I think that's, uh, that, that's what this is. And there are lots of recently discovered uh, applications in, in control, uh, combinatorial optimization, signal processing, uh, circuit design, machine learning, statistics, finance, and so on. Now, the impact um, on a field varies uh, because it depends on lots of things. Um, well, for example, in machine learning, I would say it's, it's a conceptual impact. It hasn't really changed anything because these these, a lot of these problems are dominated by huge scale. So it's not like you can just say, oh, okay, that's convex, and then walk away. So uh, in other cases, actually, it is, uh, you can actually solve the, I mean, in control, it actually just works. Um, in uh, problem, smaller problems in statistics and in finance, certainly, and signal processing and in circuit design, you can just do these things. So, okay. So there are some challenges. Um, I'll, I'll go from the bottom up. Uh, so um, in the theory category, I mean, convex analysis, that's 100 years old. It's more than 100 years old. Okay, so it's a, just a branch of math. They pretty much knew everything by 1971. I mean, you know, more or less, there's still stuff being done. People who do that would be very irritated if they heard me say that, but, but okay, so basically this was kind of done by 1970, roughly, okay? Which is not, and you need people doing this, that's great. Um, 
And uh, there is the people, there's lots of people working out complexity theory for, for algorithms uh, like that. Um, uh, that's good too. Um, so, but I'll, I'll say a little bit about how, how these methods um, actually work in, in practice as well. Okay, so a bunch of people working on algorithm development. So here you're working on developing things like reliable efficient algorithms for specific applications, special classes, um, or in some cases just general convex optimization problems. Um, and, and of course there's, there's people who, who work on sort of at the high algorithmic level and then those who work on the details of the software implementation. Right. And in fact, how these things work actually, to be blunt about it, actually this often matters much more than, for example, this stuff. So I, you go to conference and you see people getting up and screaming at each other and saying, yeah, my primal dual search direction makes this thing converge in 19 steps, whereas yours took 23. Um, but of course, exact, you know, how you do your linear algebra matters like, can matter by a factor of 100, right? So here, here are the theorists arguing with each other about 17 versus 23 iterations, or even less relevant, you know, n to the 3.5 or n to the, three, you know, 4 or what, this kind of thing. Um, when in fact it turns out they should really be concentrating on uh, how they do their factorizations and things. Uh, so, okay. Um, and then at the highest level, um, or at least at the top of the slide, <laughs> um, there's the question of modeling. Um, and so this is the question of uh, posing practical problems um, with, so you want to form, form a problem, write a problem as a convex problem, and this can be approximate, um, and, and the level of violence involved in mapping a problem to a convex one can range from zero or minimal in the sense that someone gives you the problem, you change some variables or whatever, and it's exactly equivalent, and now it's an SOCP or something. And, you're, and if, if the problem is not dominated by huge scale or tight real-time requirements, you're done. That's it. You quit. And you have no apologies to make. No footnotes, no... Nothing like that, it's just done. Um, then there are ones where you, you, there's terms in there that you can't handle exactly and you put in an approximation, these are mild and so on. And then you get up to the ones where there's really um, approximately is being very, very generous. And these would be in relaxations, for example, of combinatorial optimization problems where you could hardly uh, say that you've solved the problem, but what you're gonna end up with, well, you end up with two things there. Of course, you end up with a lower bound on the hard problem and you end up with an outstanding heuristic. Uh, for a, a local, for a, um, for a suboptimal method. So, and, and those, okay. So, now, once you've done that, if you have anything to apologize for, for example, approximations, uh, missed terms, ignored constraints, and things like that, then you have to go back and, and verify the, the practical uh, performance of it. Okay. So now, I'll say a little bit um, about uh, convex optimization modeling tools. So, yeah. Everything you said until now, instead of convex optimization, you could have just said looking for a local optimum. Is there anything special about convex no. that doesn't? No. Nothing. You're right. Uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, so, but as a zeroth order statement, that is correct. Right? That, that if, if instead of solving the problem, you mean finding a local solution, then much of what I said, almost all, will, will just translate immediately. Um, there is actually a difference. So it turns out um, there, there's issues of scaling and the algorithms are trickier and things like that because you have to deal with things that have, are either super flat or have the wrong curvature or something like that. Whereas a lot of these, the, when you get a convex problem, they're actually, the, the, these issues just go away. They don't happen, right? And not only that, they're reliably things like 20 steps, 25 steps. Absolutely reliable, right? And actually, I, I'm pretty sure, and whereas, and so I think what it is is that they're, they're reliable, whereas a local, so a good local optimal, uh, op, uh, optimization method will be quite reliable and quite fast, uh, but actually there's some parameters in there that have to be tuned. There's a little bit more babysitting. Um, you know, when you take a look at one of these things, I, I won't name any or whatever, but you know, you, you run it, and if it's your lucky day, 25 steps, done. Actually, you can actually do a cool experiment. You can do this. Take a convex problem in a form that can be handled by a nonlinear solver and call a nonlinear solver. Right? You're going to get the global solution. So the question is, which is better? The answer is that the convex optimization solvers are far, far superior. 
that the other ones either fail. Of course, if you go in and set 14 parameters just right, it'll work. It's got to. Theory says it will, right? So, so that, that was all, uh, all of that is, is the difference between what I've just said, how it would transpose to finding a local solution of a non-convex problem. Okay. So here's some uh, general approaches. So um, the first uh, is to do the following. Uh, and this is yeah, maybe the most, I don't know, it's, it's a method. You use a general solver, uh, maybe even, I mean, which is one for convex optimization, and you merely assume that the FI are convex and you proceed. So now, if you evaluate a, um, if you evaluate a Hessian, and it does, it's not positive definite, for example, a Cholesky factorization fails, everything can grind to a halt, and you can now go back and say, your problem's not convex. Indeed, here's an X, and F3 uh, doesn't have a Cholesky factorization. Uh, the, great, the Hessian of F3 doesn't have a Cholesky factorization. So you've proved it's non-convex. Um, now, this is easier, it's easy on the user because it's, a it's the traditional interface for optimization. You provide, um, you provide methods for evaluating the functions, gradients, and maybe Hessians, right? So it's the traditional interface. So it's easy on the user. But you really lose a lot of the benefits of convex optimization. Uh, I mean, one is that, of course, you know uh, that you can actually certify uh, global, uh, that the solution is global. Um, but the other is the reliability you give up on. So, okay. Now, the, a second uh, gross category is this. Um, and it's, it's one that makes sort of sense. You would take the problem described in some high-level language, some algebraic form, let's say. And then you would write a tool that would scan that problem description, high-level problem description, and it would attempt to prove that the problem you have is convex. Maybe transform it to a, some convex problem, something like that. So that, that sort of makes sense. Um, and you can, you can make things like this. Um, and actually, uh, we have, meaning sort of with students, um, we've done this maybe even a, a while ago. Um, now, you, know, you can quickly check, find out that, that verifying a problem is convex in general uh, is sort of NP hard, so I can easily write down something where if you, well, it, it, all, it is, all you're doing, uh, so I'll mention how these things work typically. Um, these are basically, you do interval, interval computation with second derivatives. You do integer, that's actually all you're doing is interval arithmetic. Because to establish convexity, all you want to know is that the second derivative is non-negative. So you can do all tricks with, um, uh, you can do all sorts of tricks with interval arithmetic. Um, and if you're able ultimately to establish that the second derivatives of the FIs are all in zero something, you win. Okay? So, uh, by the way, there's, there's at least one commercial version of this uh, fielded right now. And this thing called Solver, the solver.com uh, did this. So, um, okay. Um, I had a student who worked on this. This was his uh, dissertation and he put it all together and um, so he comes into my office and had this very sophisticated thing where there were various bounds on each of the functions and they would, um, uh, you know, once one, anything known, you know, one, a tightened bound known by one variable would send a message to all the things that use that variable. They would tighten their bounds. This would go on for a long time. So he came into my office and he wrote down this horrible thing with like, you know, hyperbolic cosines and logs and exp and stuff like that. And he said, do you think that's convex? And I'm like, who, who the hell would know? I, I, who would know, right? So he said, it is. And it only, you know, and it took 987 iterations of this method to prove that it's convex. And we looked at this horrible expression and we both said, that is really cool. And we looked at it and we sat there for like, in silence for like 30 seconds and we looked at it. We both looked at each other and we said, it's useless. <laughs> and we came to the conclusion that um, that's not what you want. Because even if you had a thing, I mean, it's kind of cool to have. You can impress your friends by writing down horrible functions that are convex. But it, that it's actually not the right way to do it. In, in my opinion, I mean, well, for my, to, my, to my thinking, it's not the right way to do it. Because even if you know some horrible expression is convex, um, what it is is you're not, you know, this, this is not maintainable, right? If someone writes some code that solves a problem and, and it is actually convex, 
they leave or whatever, somebody else comes in, you, don't, you have no idea why it's convex. You change one constant from point 0.1 to point 0.3 and all of a sudden it's not convex anymore. Um, you have no idea. Some things, of course, you can change the sign of a coefficient, nothing happens. Other things, it changes it. So the, the whole point is that that's not, main, that, that, that's, the intention, the, it, that's not maintainable uh, if someone writes stuff like that. So, that's, by the way, he was perfectly okay with this, the, the, the student. Because it's a, it's a lower bound result. You, th he thinks that you think of it that way. Very useful. It says, this is how it shouldn't be done. Or something <laughs> like that. So it's, a, it's one of those. Yeah, very useful, right? So, um, okay. Now, the, the one, actually, after much thinking about this, it seems to me that the way you really want to do this is this. You really want to construct a problem as convex from the outset. I mean, that's actually really what you want to do. Because if you do that, uh, and the way to do that is basically to follow a restricted set of rules and methods. And I'll, I'll talk about these in a minute. Um, if you do this, then convexity verification is automatic. And as we'll see, transforming the problem to one that is solvable by an interior point method is totally automatic. It's trivial. Okay? So we'll see that. Um, and the advantage of this is this is maintainable because the intention of the modeler it is made explicit. So this, this actually sort of makes sense uh, to, to us. Um, OK. All right. So how, how can you tell if a problem is convex? Well, you need to check convexity of functions. We already talked about this. Um, I mean, you can use the first order, uh, various basic definitions. Um, but in fact, the best way to do this is via convex calculus. So you start with a library of basic atoms examples that are convex, and then you construct more complicated functions from various calculus rules and transformations. Now, there are lots of these. In fact, this is, of course, just, this, is, this is called convex analysis, basically. I mean, r roughly. It's the two bullet uh, synopsis of what convex analysis is. Um, then there's lots and lots of rules. Um, but it turns out a very small number will get you very, very far. So, but let's just start with some basic examples. So, there's some obvious ones. Powers are either convex or concave, uh, depending on, uh, depending on the, 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 the uh, exponent. You know, exponential, negative log, entropy, negative entropy, these are uh, convex functions. Um, I mean, these are very easy to show. Any affine function is convex. Um, sum of squares is convex. Here's maybe the first one that not a lot of people would know is convex. And it's not obvious until somebody tells you. Well, OK, it's not hard. Someone has to tell you. The sum of the squares divided by an independent positive variable. That's not obvious. That's convex jointly in x and y. It's obviously convex in x because for any fixed positive y, it's a multiple of sum of squares. It's obviously convex in y because that's a positive number divided by y. 1 over y goes like this. It's convex. That's obvious. What's not obvious is that that is jointly convex in x and y. So that, that's maybe the first example of a basic function that most people wouldn't know instantly or immediately is convex. Okay? It's, it's sum of squares divided by a positive variable. A norm, that's obvious from triangle inequality. Um, the max of a bunch of variables, uh, the max function is convex. And then log sum exp is convex. Um, of course, that's sort of like a smooth version of that. Um, but so log sum exp is, is also convex. Um, and, and various people would know, would know these things, or would know them, but maybe not remember that they know them or something like that. So, um, OK. Um, here would be some others. The log of the cumulative density function of a Gaussian uh, is concave. Okay? So that's, uh, and actually, it's interesting because a lot of these, uh, all sorts of classical inequalities uh, come. From, from these facts. Uh, so for example, here, if you write down the classical inequality for a, you, you get one of the, I forget which named uh, inequality, you get an approximation and a bound on, on, the, um, on, on the Gaussian CDF. Here's one, maybe, and uh, some people don't know this, but the log of the determinant of the inverse of a positive definite matrix, that's convex, okay, in, in the matrix. So again, it's not obvious. These are not hard to show or something, but these are just these would be just sort of some of the examples. Um, calculus rules. There's zillions of them, um, but the the turns out that you can fit on one page um, 
the ones that will get you 90% of the way. Um, and actually, this is not minimal, because they all fall, in fact, all of these follow from the last one. So, so in fact, you can just get one rule. But nevertheless, for explaining these to, peop normal, to people and, and not uh, machines, what it means is actually that the code is much shorter than the uh, slides, actually, when you, when you actually do things like this. So, um, so, you know, some things are obvious. You have non-negative scalings. If you scale something, this whatever, the, it, it remains convex if it's a positive constant. Um, the sum of convex functions is convex. Um, affine composition. So it says if, if f is convex, then if you, if you precompose f with an affine mapping, this thing is convex. I mean, these are just very easy to verify. Pointwise maximum, that's maybe the first sort of non-obvious one. Here's one, partial minimization. Not totally obvious. Um, so if you have a function that is jointly convex in two, in two groups of variables, and you minimize over one of them in a convex set, the result, which is the, it's, partial, it's basically partial minimization. You're minimizing f over some of the variables. That's a convex function of the remaining variables. Okay? And, you know, most of these are very easy to show and things like that. And then here's actually the real one, is composition. So, if a function is convex and increasing, and f is convex, then h of f of x is convex. And there are generalizations of that to multiple arguments and a few variations on it. But it turns out this actual, from this, I can construct all of those easily. Um, and you can get it all sorts of ways. Uh, I mean, some are just completely trivial here. For example, if f is affine, I mean, if, if well, f, if f down here is affine, that's this, then this, so this one implies that one. It certainly does sum, because the function that takes the sum of two numbers is convex, so that works. Um, it does pointwise maximum, because the maximum function is convex and, and, and non-decreasing in all of its arguments. Therefore, max of convex functions is convex. So, and this one you can also get this way, but I, 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 won't, I, won't, I won't go through that. So, so th there's, actually a very, there's actually two rules, it turns out, that, that you really need to know. But it's, it's useful to think of them this way. OK. So you can now construct examples. Um, you can do things like this. Uh, you have affine functions. They're obviously uh, convex. You can have the max of a bunch of them. And therefore, you get a piecewise linear convex function like that. That's going to be convex. Um, we can look at the L1 regularized least squares cost. Uh, so this function is convex because that's affine. That sum of squares is convex. Uh, that's convex. It's a norm. As long as lambda is positive, that's convex. And the sum rule makes the whole thing convex. Um, here's one. The sum of the, for example, seven largest elements of a vector. Right? So that's a, it's a complicated function, but it's convex. So no one's saying anything. So maybe we should, am I going too fast? Too slow? Too slow. OK? All right. All right, fine. So, so this is, and this, uh, oh, by the way, how do you show this? What's a quick way to show this? Max. What? Max. Max of a lot of functions. Right, of a lot of functions, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's max up, yeah. Yeah, so you, you consider uh, the inner product. Uh, you, you, you look at C transpose x, where C is a vector with, let's go for 7. Seven ones, n minus seven zeros, of which there are n choose seven of these. And the max over all of those, n choose seven of those, is that function, is the sum of the largest ones. Okay, so, okay. Um, okay, so I won't go into any, uh, any more of these. Oh, uh, one interesting thing is that, you know, most of the interesting ones are actually non-differentiable, and that's not a big deal. So it means you can throw away your book that is filled with gradients. So, actually, um, don't throw it away. Set it on a shelf because we're going to go get it back later in the talk. So, uh, so OK. What's that? Yeah, just, yeah, OK. So uh, just a couple more examples. Um, you know, maximum eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix, um, norm of a general matrix. Um, here's one that's, of, uh, 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 that's actually getting a lot of interest right now, is the dual uh, of the spectral norm of a matrix. This is the sum of the singular values. This is the analog for people who don't know. Um, this, it, this is to the rank of a matrix as the L1 norm is to the sparsity of a vector. Okay, so 
And so what that means is, let's see if I can, it means that you can transpose all of the ideas from like compressed sensing and sparse stuff where you regularize with L1. If you have a problem, and that's where you want to, that's where you want to sparse something to be sparse. If you want to do the same, if you want, if you have a problem where you're looking for low rank matrices, this serves the purpose of the L1 norm. Okay? Um, okay. Here's one. Um, the negative log probability, uh, this is the yield. So this basically says I have a convex set. Um, I have a, a Z is N zero sigma, but the fact is that any log concave distribution would work. So any distribution whose density, log of the density is concave, which is most of the distributions you know about. In fact, it's very hard to even think of one that's not. So, which fact, I don't know, you can go ahead and try to think of one. Uh, what? Yeah, sure, okay, fine. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, it has to have a name. <laughs> a short name, a single name. <laughs> this is, it's like, come on, anybody can do that. Come on, you can go ahead and try, you know. Go, you know, you can, no, ser it, it's a serious exercise, I don't know. What's that? Oh, no, I think that might be okay. Yeah, wish art, all these fancy, you know, no, it's, it's, I actually don't know the answer to it. There probably is one or two named, single named, for the, just, <laughs> Distribution, right? Density, which is not log concave. So I don't know. Somebody could look at if they have somebody could look it up on Wikipedia or something. We can find. Anyway, all right. So if you have uh, a log concave density, and then this is the yield function. That's the yield function because it basically as a function. So when you you pick a point, uh, z is manufacturing variation, and you want to know what's the probability that when you have to set the target. That the that the combined uh, the manufactured one is in the is in the, that's this thing, and that is log concave, which means that it's minus log probability that you're in a set is convex. Okay, uh, that has lots of actually very interesting implications. Um, it well I I mean I'll tell you a couple right now that I'm not going to talk about today, but are very uh, one would be this, just as an example. It says that pretty much anything you can do with linear measurements, estimation with linear measurements, so if you take, you know, if you have a whole bunch of measurements that look like AX plus V or something where V is Gaussian or your favorite uh, log concave density. Um, so anything you can do with that, you can do, for example, with horribly quantized measurements. So that this, it turns out all those problems are convex. So here's, here's, here is, here, you, here's, here's a good sensor. I give you the sine of A transpose X plus B. That's all. So that's a one-bit sensor. And it turns out I can estimate X superbly from one-bit measurements. And that's, these are all convex problems. And that all follows from this. Because the negative log likelihood is then convex. Okay, so. So, the, I mean, a lot of these things have, ser they have serious uh, implications. Um, here's one. It says that if you form a, a vector, X transpose matrix inverse X, this is actually convex in X and the matrix, provided the matrix positive definite. Is there a question? Yeah, I can, we can go off. I mean, I, we can, we, we, any of these things we can go off on tangents and things that work. So, if you want. Okay. All right. So how do you solve a, a convex problem? Well, really the best method is to use someone else's solver. Um, <laughs> that's by, by far. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. That's, that's by far the best one. Um, now the problem with that is your problem has to be in a standard form. Uh, now the good news of an arrangement like this is that uh, you, get all, you, you get the cost of solver development is amortized across many users. So there's people who spend all day long just making solvers with the knowledge that thousands of people are going to use them. So that's, it all kind of makes sense. Um, you can write your own custom solver, uh, and that's for your particular problem. Um, and that's lots of work, but actually you get, lot, you get huge advantages if you do. You can get very large advantages, because if you, if, you know, if you know the problems you're solving, you know the scalings, and there's all sorts of sparsity and other structure you can exploit, you can often do really, really well. Um, but it's, a, you know, it's, it's more trouble than this. This, this requires you to you know, type uh, make, basically, uh, up here. Um, 
This one, roughly. Uh, this one, this is serious development. Um, now, there's something else. The, the, the standard method is this, is you, well, a method, is to transform your problem into a standard form and then use a standard solver. And you can think of this several ways. You can think of it as extending the reach of problems that can be solved using standard solvers. Um, but this is actually a pain. Uh, we'll see that it is a, it, that it is a pain. So, um, in general, to, to do this. I, it's not like it's, um, it's just cumbersome. Um, and then we're going to look at methods that, that, that formalize uh, this last approach. Okay. Ah, before I start, I should mention um, this. Um, it's actually a good thing to know that there are general convex optimization solvers. They, some of them are three lines long, literally. Um, they work always. They solve all convex problems. Okay. The proof of that is about one paragraph. Okay? So, and there are even some that are actually efficient in theory. So ellipsoid method would be your first, your first one. Uh, sorry, now you're up to five lines of code, including comments. So that's, um, yeah? If it's the same ellipsoid as Scholz and Xi'an, it's a little it's yeah. efficient if you have infinite precision, as best I remember. Or at least you need very, very good precision for fairly trivial problems, no? N no, the problem is not with precision. The problem is that it, it really takes as long as the upper bound uh, tells you. And so in practice, uh, th they're not, you know, these things don't work that well, even if they really are polynomial time. Um, so they're, uh, now, in fact, all of these, these are, are typically slow in practice. By the way, they, they do work well because, you know, the, the coding is not much. As I said, it's five lines. The interfaces you require, all you need is something that, that gets a subgradient for you. Uh, and a subgradient, unlike a gradient, um, is, uh, well, a subgradient is actually, if you can write down the problem, you can get a subgradient. So that, that much I can assure you from sub subgradient calculus. So. so these are nice to know. Actually, they do have their, their uh, uses. If you need to solve a small problem, really, you know, and you don't care, and you, and you don't mind going to lunch or something like that, you can write the code in about three minutes, then go to lunch, come back, and, and the answer might be there if your problem's not that big. Um, so, which is which beats you know whatever doing some huge code development thing to, to or finding some you know that something that works and then reading the terrible documentation that someone wrote something like that. Okay, so it's actually just good. This is just it's just cool to know that these things exist, and they actually do have their uses. Um, for example, uh, the subgradient methods. It turns out, I mean, you can build uh, a whole theory, or I mean, a whole well theory and practice of distributed convex optimization based on these. So they absolutely have their place. Um, so these are not just sort of, I mean, they're interesting to know about, but they also do have uh, use, I'm not going to talk about distributed methods here, so, but they, they do have their places. Okay. Um, then you have interior point convex optimization solvers. Um, now here, people who work on it in the modern era would, would like to think that everything started in the 90s. But in fact, it goes back to the 60s. And for example, for LPs, they discovered some, some Russian guy uh, who was completely unknown in the Soviet Union, known outside. And it was all there. All the stuff from like 1995 was, was there. Um, there's even books written on this stuff in the 1960s. I mean, they don't know everything. Oh, yeah, Fiacco and McCormick. You know this book? It's called uh, Fiacco and McCormick. And I forget the name of it. Do um, you remember the name of this thing? Sequential unconstrained minimization techniques. That's it. So, you know, if you look at that, you'll, you'll find that they know a shocking amount uh, there. I mean, some of it, you'll see clearly what they don't know. They don't know, for example, the choice of barrier is like some kind of voodoo type thing. They, they don't know how that works, right? Um, but bottom line is, they knew what interior point methods were, period, in 1969, and could articulate it pretty well. Uh, and they didn't have a complexity theory, but then such things didn't, no one thought to ask questions like, pardon me, but what's the largest number of steps it would take your method uh, to calculate an epsilon suboptimal solution? So no one asked those questions, so it's hardly fair to blame them for not answering them. So, seems reasonable, right? I'm more shocked that nobody asked the question that, that they didn't have the answer. Yeah, it, it is weird, isn't it? Oh, no, no, the, the style. The, the, the order of the 
Yeah, you know, so, uh, no, no, order they did. So this, the style of sort of algorithm analysis in, in the 60s would be to do things like talk about quadratic convergence, super linear convergence, and things like yeah, that. It was not to say, I can solve this and end of the 3.5, you know, log one over epsilon steps or something like that. So that, that was a shift that came later. I know, it seems weird, doesn't it? Because the most obvious question to ask is, what's an upper bound on how many, how long it would take you to solve a problem? The quadratic, because you get frustrated, you're sitting there watching an iteration on a primitive computer, right. and it just never seems to get the number decimal. Right, so quadratic was a big deal. I, 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 definitely. Yeah. Does Karma Car fit into this? Slide? Yes, absolutely. Right. So, so the popularization in the West, this is out, outside of uh, Moscow, uh, was from um, was Karma Car. So, and Katyan, right? Who who used these things? Well, and then uh, there uh, uh, around that time, a lot of these things uh, sort of started becoming known. But a lot of them. Actually, not really the interior point method so much, but the others all trace to Moscow State University in the 60s. So that's where they all come from. And a couple from uh, Kiev, but, but that's pretty much it. Um, OK. Now, these methods, uh, they, ha they handle smooth uh, functions, and also functions in conic form. So these are to be things like second order cone programs, semi-definite programs. But they'll handle things like geometric programs and things like that. Um, and these are extremely efficient. They typically require a few tens of iterations, almost independent of problem type and size. So that's accepted. Uh, it's an empirical fact. It's, it's, not a, it's nothing else. Um, but it'd be like, simple, it'd be like uh, the empirical fact that simplex works really well. Right? So, so it's just, a, and, it, and it's now been verified across, you know, zillions and zillions of problems and uh, scaling all the way to in, immense sizes and things like that. So, um, now each iteration involves solving a set of equations. And in fact, these are just least squares problems with the same size and structure as the original problem. That's a very interesting, now you have very interesting uh, interpretation. Computationally, if, if you were to, um, if you were to look, if you were to profile a convex optimization solver, here's exactly what you would find it doing. It, would so, it will solve 25 least squares problems, period. All right, so maybe it's 50 in one thing and maybe it's 10 in another, but you know, roughly a few tens of least squares problems of the same size, period. That's it. There'd be some other little calculations, but it doesn't matter. Um, that actually has very important implications because it says if you have a field where if it's large scale, you have a method to solve the least squares problem. For example, you know, it's in medical imaging and you have some fast transform and you use some preconditioned conjugate gradient type method, something like this, all of that transposes. And it means you can solve convex problems in 20 of those steps. That's what it means. Actually, sometimes faster. I'll talk about that later. OK. So uh, there would be absolutely no point to not use an interior points solver if you can. Uh, so yeah. I mean, there, would be, there, are, there are other methods that are neither of these and so on. But they're, uh, and they each probably have sort of, sort of one area. You, know, you can find a place where it would be better than something else. But these just seem to work. Okay, so here are some. Um, I, I, this is what Google is for, so there's no point really doing this. Um, but uh, so you'd have lots of LPs and QPs, um, and then there's different groups use different things uh, for sort of general purpose ones. In, in MATLAB would be Sadumi SDPT3. These are cone solvers. Uh, there are ones written in C that are open source. And each of these you know, might have some specialty, like solving low rank SDPs or this or that or something. I don't know. Um, there are commercial ones. Uh, this is a very high quality one, uh, is Mosec. Um, Solver.com uh, actually has uh, LP and SOCPs. Um, that's frontline, right? That's frontline systems, yeah, exactly. Um, then other ones would be, there's a, the CVX Opt, this is by Levin Vandenberg at UCLA and, and some others. That's Python C, so it's open source, uh, it's untainted uh, all the way through. Uh, well, sorry, for those of us who <clears throat> are in the GNU camp. <laughs> that includes me, but so, so uh, it's untainted here, uh, th this one. And some of these others are, are like that as well. Well, no, they're not. If you see that in there, it's obviously not. Um, okay, so there's lots of these. Um, and then let's, let me talk a little bit about this idea of uh, what if an interpoint method can't 
you know, hand, how do you do this? So, so here you have a problem uh, with an L1 norm. So it's obviously not differentiable, right? So how do you solve that? Well, I mean, it obvious, this is also, of course, this would come up in, you know, whatever lasso or whatever these, are, you know, basis pursuit or whichever one you want to call these things. Um, it's a convex problem, but it's not differentiable, so you can't directly use an interior point method. And the basic idea is to transform it uh, so that you can use an interior point method. Okay, so, and the way you do that is something like this. Um, you start with these n variables, um, like that, and you introduce new a new set of n uh, variables here, and these serve as upper bounds on the absolute values of the xi's. And so you simply write, it, write out a new problem that looks like this. The objective is now smooth, quadratic, and there are now two n inequality constraints. So, and you have to actually sit down and you actually show that these are equivalent in the following sense. If you solve that, uh, you've actually solved that by a simple transformation. In this case, it's ignoring t. Um, and if you solve this one, you can solve that one. And that's simple by setting ti equals absolute value xi. So they're the same. Now you might say, oh my god, you, know, you took, started with a problem with n variables and zero constraints, and now you have a problem with two n, you have a problem with two n variables and two n constraints. Um, and in fact, so you might imagine that you've done a terrible thing. But it turns out um, uh, there's no law. If you know, if the linear algebra is smart enough to handle this, you'll do unbelievably well. That there'll be absolutely no loss whatsoever. Even though the number of variables has doubled, the number of constraints went from 0 to 2n. And the reason is kind of obvious. Um, the sparsity pattern on the constraints, it's extremely sparse. For example, T3 only involves X3. X3 only involves uh, T3, period. So, so you can just imagine when you visualize the sparsity pattern, if you interleave the variables correctly, you just get tiny little blocks. And this, of course, will run in linear time, uh, in linear algebra. OK. So the, the, you can extend this idea. Um, so people know these tricks, right? This is basically, uh, these transformation tricks are, have been known since 1950. So they're in uh, Danzig's book on linear programming. So that's, so every, you know, if, if we, when you take a traditional LP course, you learn how to solve, not L1, but maybe like an L infinity problem or something like that. And so there's just these tricks. I mean, you learn them and you use them and stuff like that. Um, uh, some of the tricks are not obvious. Okay. So here's the idea. You start with a, a convex optimization problem. Um, and what you do is you carry out a sequence of equivalence transformations. So, um, and by the way, this, I mean, so this is kind of like a standard thing you do in a, well, this is what a compiler would do. So the idea is you start with a, uh, a description and then you carry out transformations where at each step you can prove or you know uh, that they're equivalent. So you carry out this, uh, this these are like uh, you, you're doing um, transformations, until you arrive at a target, and the target is one that can be handled by your solver. Right, so that, that's kind of the idea. Um, then, of course, once you, once you solve this problem, when you do this reduction here, um, it also comes with a method that will transform the solution backwards. So. That's, uh, but that's, that's kind of obvious, so you do this. Now, when you do things like this, um, you know, we, we've done a bunch now, and it, you might imagine, so the first idea is you use method like this to, to give you rapid prototyping of problems. Um, that's, because you know what, hey, you type in a little baby problem with 100 variables, next thing you know there's like 1,000. And you think, well, this is kind of, it's fine for rapid prototyping, but you wouldn't want, you know, you think it's too slow. It's actually not slow at all, if you know what you're doing. Not, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's, there's no slowdown at all. You have a problem with 1,000 variables. It's huge, but it's sparse. And it, it's just, you know, it's the kind of thing that a sparse matrix method dreams of getting its hand on, because it's got, you know, little, it's got little tiny blocks and long tendrils and things like that. It's just, it's perfect. So, so actually, amazingly, these methods work they're actually efficient. OK. Um, OK, so there's a connection between those calculus rules and these transformations. In fact, more than a connection, they're the same thing. So here's the way it works. Um, you know that the max of two convex functions is convex. Okay. Well, there's actually a rule that goes like this. When you observe this in one of these transformed problems, when you ob observe this thing, you should do the following. You so you get it, you, we, have a, so we have expression trees for all the constraints and the objective. So we, we, we have the trees, we've parsed it, and we do the following. When you see a node that looks like that, 
You simply replace it with a new variable t, and you replace the, and you put these two inequalities in. Okay. Um, if you see something which is a convex increasing function of a convex function, which we know is convex, you simply take this, this that's, a, that's, that's a node on the tree, and all you're doing is composition. What you do is this, you replace it with h of t, and you, you actually add a new constraint that looks like this. Okay? Now, this looks completely trivial. Um, they're not, because what, what happens is this. You could do this actually whether or not the rules were correct. Um, <laughs> However, these transformations actually preserve, are, you, you get an equivalent problem if and only if the assumptions from convex analysis hold. So for example, here, you'd say, you can do this whether or not h is increasing. If h is increasing, then you can prove actually that, that, the, new, that the new problem you've generated is equivalent. If h is not increasing, it's not, um, including all the fine details that you have to, 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 to handle. So I don't know if that made sense, but that's the, uh, that's the idea. So. So there's a connection between these. All right, so I mean, I, this is kind of obvious, right? But if you, if you have expression, expression trees that describe the, the Fs here, so you have a high-level algebraic description of your problem, um, it turns out that if someone comes to you and says, how do you know it's convex? And you go, well, you know, that's affine, that's convex, and really? I gotta speed up? I gotta speed up a lot. You're right, okay, fine, we'll go faster. Um, it, it turns out the same argument, that if, if, you have the, if you take the parse tree and annotate it and say, and give the argument, give the proof that it's convex, you could also uh, automatically generate the transformation. Okay. This lead, brings us to discipline convex programming. Um, and here, uh, you would, you specify a convex problem in natural form. Um, and then uh, it'll, it'll follow a limited set of rules. I'll, I'll show you what those are. And you can implement these several ways. But here's one. This is CVX. This is written on top of MATLAB. There's other ones that run under Python and a couple of others, in fact, that use like C++, stuff like that. So OK. So here'd be an example. Here's a problem you want to solve. You know, who knows why? It's some machine learning problem with some kind of sparsity-inducing regularization with some inequality constraints. And this would be the executable source code in, um, in CVX. So, so CVX would just parse that, um, and let's see, uh, what's that? Any question? We'll ask you. Um, what if lambda were negative here, and CVX parsed this? What would happen? Would it should it fail? I think it should fail. It'll fail. Um, actually, it'll fail even if this problem, even if this expression. It might be that for lambda equals minus 0 0.01, this is convex. That might be. Uh, very unlikely, but possible. Even, but it doesn't matter. It will fail because this violates a rule. Because this would be concave plus convex. And it would give you back, an, it would give you back something that says, discipline con convex programming violation. You can't add a convex and a concave function. Okay? So that's what would happen here. Not the same as saying it's not convex. It says you failed to follow the rules. OK, so that's simple enough. Um, here's, by the way, what this problem looks like. This is how you would solve it uh, traditionally. Traditionally, you'd get a cone solver like Sedumi or something like that. And you'd fill in a whole bunch of matrices and things like that, call the cone solver, and then pull out your, your variables. This is, um, no, I know, we did this for years and years and years. This is how we did it. Um, and we didn't do it, actually. We made grad students do it. That's <laughs> how, is how is how this was done. So, so uh, because you take one look at that and you realize that's not something, that's, that's not appropriate for a professor to do, really. You know, <laughs> right? yeah, look at that. So, but actually, the boundaries have changed, right? Because you see this. Uh, that's fine. Professors can do that. Right? So it's really changing the boundaries between. OK, all right. So I want to speed up so I won't go into the, the history of, of modeling languages for optimization. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into it. But it has a long history. It goes back to the 70s. Um, and there are lots of them. Uh, they, they vary in, in the amount of uh, problem structure that they assume and, and sort of what the whole idea of the, pro of, of the method is, right? Is it supposed to be a best effort method where anything you type in, uh, it does something? Um, or is it supposed to be a, like a strongly typed method where it's very rigid, but if you follow those rules, you, you, you're guaranteed to have, uh, it, it, it will work. So 
there's variations on it. Um, I should also say that it's actually changed things like the course um, that I teach on this subject um, dramatically. Uh, so I, you know, I taught it. I, it was already a big class, but I taught it at one point when homework involved something like that. Um, you know, that's a pain in the ass, basically. Um, you know, so you would very carefully think about numerical problems and things like that. When in fact, you can write three lines and do a lot of stuff. You can do machine learning, you can do finance, you can do control, you can do signal processing, you can do network optim. When it comes down to like writing five lines of code, it's, it just frees you completely, at least when you're teaching. So, and it's a lot of fun now, because you know, it, the class, we do the theory, um, but you leave that class, you haven't talked about support vector machines. You haven't talked about machine learning. You've done, you haven't talked about portfolio optimization. You've done all of it. And not only that, with shockingly small uh, things, right? So it's actually just been a lot of fun. It's changed the research too. But, okay. So we'll do some examples, but maybe in the interest of time, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over um, one of them and, and, and we'll go just to this one because it's fun. So, because I think a lot of you are in machine learning and stuff like that. Good. So this one has a quiz, so you better listen. Uh, in fact, it is a quiz. So here it is. I have a, a random variable in R2. Um, it's got normal uh, 0, 1 marginals in X and Y. And uh, its second, third, and fourth moments are going to match a Gaussian. So, right. Expected value x, y is zero, and it means x and y are uncorrelated, for example. Not independent, but uncorrelated. Um, I don't know, whatever the third and fourth moments are too, those, ma those, those match those of a Gaussian. And the question is, how small can the probability that both x and y are negative be? That's my, obviously if x and y are normal, the answer is a quarter, because it's the third quadrant. So I'm, I'm waiting. Must be a really tiny number, otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question. Okay, tiny. You want to put a number on it? 1e e minus 6. Okay, 1e e minus 6. Otherwise, you wouldn't ask the question. It's always these non intuitive professors come. No, 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 that, no. That's old style. No, no, that's old style. No, 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 no. No, because then if it was 1e e minus 6, it would probably be numerical error, and you'd have to do careful things to figure out if it's. Something small. Okay, yeah, all right. All right. Any other guesses? Zero. Zero. That's indeed small. Okay, so. Well, the mean has to be, the mean has to be zero, so. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I guess the point is, it's not obvious. I've asked a lot of probabilists all over the place. Some get shockingly close, some are, you know, uh, so. No, no, okay, so that's it. So it's, just, it's just not obvious. You can make an argument either way. Um, so, you can write this as an LP, uh, as a, as a um, you, you can just discretize it. And if you want to be careful and kind of get outer, you know, up, provable upper and lower bounds, you can discretize it carefully. Um, I didn't do that here, but you could. And so you would just write it out as a giant LP after discretizing. And you'd have, you could see various things. These are the two marginals. Um, these are the, these are the second uh, order, uh, these are the second order um, uh, moments, or cross moments. Uh, the xi squareds comes for free because the marginals are, are Gaussian. So you don't even have to do those. And then these are the third moments. Uh, they work out. Okay, so here's the source code. Um, it would be a huge pain in the ass, by the way, to write this out as an LP. Uh, even, I mean, even, most graduate students would just say no. When they finally, when they looked at the problem, uh, realized what was involved and all that kind of stuff, they, any sensible one would just say no. Um, but you just write it out. It's like uh, just absolutely nothing here. Um, okay. So here's the Gaussian, and um, here's the answer. So it's 6%. That's the answer. Okay, so, you know, who knew? Um, I've had people say anything from 0 to uh, like 0.24, right? Say that, you know, because you can't go above a quarter because a Gaussian gives you a quarter. Um, okay, what's that? No? Okay. So. Um, and here's a distribution that does it. Now, it's discretized, but you already, it's, it's weird, okay? This is not a, you were not, this, you could not say, oh, I was about to try that distribution. I mean, there's no way. And yeah, you look at it, and look, it, I mean, it does just the right thing, right? It, 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 it puts 
some sick little mass in here. The other thing is, if you look at it, you can see that it's pro the solution is probably a measure supported on some weird, if we're lucky, one-dimensional set. But it, for all I know, it could be some sick, you know, Cantor-like set. I, I don't even know. But the point is, the number 0.06 is we're totally confident in. I mean, if we bind, if we bound it, we can get the right thing and everything. Okay, so that's it. So, all right. So actually, that was just that was just that's just how much fun you can have with like five lines of code. So, okay. So I think. I'm going to move on quickly, um, and uh, actually, I, I might be okay if I, if I, if I go quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, interior point methods. So the, the uh, worst case complexity theory says that the number of steps grows no faster than the square root of the problem size. Those are the best bounds right now. Um, now, in practice, the number of steps, I've already mentioned this, is between 10 and 50. So that's, that's very, you know, and if you want to be super safe, you can go up to 80 or something like that. But that's, that's what it is. Um, and this, this appears, by the way, to, to persist. Uh, this is certainly true for problems up to a million variables. By the way, it's independent of what kind of problem it is. It could be a problem from machine learning, finance, circuit design, uh, network flow. Doesn't make control. Makes no difference. It's always the same, like this. Um, there's actually someone, Jack Gonzio in Edinburgh, um, recently came, gave a talk at Stanford, and he solved an LP, dense, with a billion variables. And we're like, wow, what'd you use? And he goes, same thing everyone else used, primal dual, and it's the one, the, the uh, homogeneous self-dual embedding, you know, blah, same one. And we, I said, how many iterations did it take? And he, oh, it took uh, two days to solve the LP. It was some big thing in uh, finance where they, they expanded a full tree out and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he said, it took two days. And I said, how many iterations was it? And he says, 21. So, Whatever these things are, they, this property of these things taking 20 steps extends to uh, problems with a billion variables. But each iteration, by the way, was, of course, quite expensive. <laughs> right, uh, but that's, uh, <coughs> okay. So e each, each step requires a solution of a set of positive definite linear equations, which is, say, solving a least squares problem. And uh, it's, in fact, it's a Newton system. And you have three gross categories. Direct dense, direct sparse, and iterative methods. They're, the truth is, in practice, you don't, they're, they're not distinct. Um, if you do you know, direct sparse factorization, if you do two steps of iterative refinement, someone could say you're using an iterative method. Iterative methods rely on preconditioners that often use direct sparse factorizations. You know, so, but grossly, these are the three main categories of uh, linear equation solving. Um, so there's dense direct ones. This is, this is your LA pack uh, type thing. Um, and here, these are just like rock solid. They just, uh, there's almost zero variance in, in how these things work. Um, sparse direct. Um, here, uh, the runtime depends on the size, the sparsity pattern, actually, but still not on the data, um, provided these are like positive definite, because they're positive definite systems. That's why, because you don't have to, you do symbolic pre-ordering, and you don't have to do uh, runtime pivoting. So that's, that's, what, that's what this is based on. Um, but this, this is actually requires a good heuristic for ordering. By the way, this undercuts the whole thing about convex optimization, if you, if you think about it. So next time you see someone who does convex optimization, you say, what are you doing? I'm solving a convex problem. And they're all high and mighty about it. And they say, yeah, but I get the global solution, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's non-heuristic and everything. You ask them. Yeah, how do you solve your, uh, your linear equations? And it'll be using a sparse solver. And technically, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a heuristic. So it's only sparse solvers work only by the grace of whatever god or gods or goddesses handle heuristics for sparse matrix orderings. So the, the, the gods of, of, of heuristic ordering. So, it's a joke. And that can really get people irritated, by the way, if you say that. Because um, you say, no, no, you're using a heuristic method. And they'll, they'll say, I am not, right? I made approximations so I could make this convex. And this is the global solution. You go, oh, no, I don't doubt that. But the method is heuristic. The, the fact that it runs in 10 minutes and not a year is basically because of uh, these sparse matrix factorizations. Then you move into the scientific computing. These are iterative methods. All bets are off. Uh, Runtime depends on data, size, sparsity. I mean, these require tuning and preconditioning. Um, so these are, not, these are certainly not general methods. 
by any means. They're just not. Um, on the other hand, it's the only way you're going to solve problems with uh, you know, 10 million or, uh, or 100 million variables. So that's, that is. Um, I'll skip over this. I'll just say that uh, I think probably everyone here knows about conjugate gradients methods anyway. Uh, these are iterative methods for solving uh, you know, large positive definite equations, large least squares problems. Um, and the interesting thing for us is not sort of the theory of them or something like that. It's that you get an awfully good solution sometimes in a shockingly small number of steps. This depends on the spectrum of, of the uh, operator involved. So I'll skip over this um, and just go uh, and, and say that if you take an interior point method and instead of solving for the search direction using a direct method, you use an iterative method, you end up with something called, there's lots of names for it, uh, limited memory, Newton. Um, it turns out it's, it's very close to BFGS. Um, it's also called a Newton iterative method. But the total effort here is measured by the cumulative sum of CG steps. Now, these are not general purpose methods. So the grad students are back in business, not writing out code to stuff entries in giant matrices now, but they're back in business um, to work out to do things like get good preconditioners up and running for, for problems and things like that. So, OK. Um, now, the nice part is in an interior point method, in fact, you really couldn't care less about solving uh, for the search directions anyway, because all you want to do is get to this solution. Uh, so it's totally irrelevant. No one cares about solving it or anything like that. You want to preserve this idea that it takes 20 steps or something like that to, to get there. OK. I'll give a quick example, and we'll move on to this uh, last topic. So this is just L1 regularized logistic regression. So you have, um, uh, you have uh, a whole bunch of, you have a bunch of data. That's xi uh, with labels uh, bi, binary labels. And you want to fit a logistic model to them for uh, something, even something like that. Um, and you add a, uh, an L1 uh, term here. And what this will do, of course, is if you crank lambda up and down, you're going to get a sparser and sparser solution uh, here. Um, the nice part about this one is you can actually do things like this. Um, you can actually, this, this is sensible. This is utterly nonsensible if, for example, the number of examples um, is smaller than the number of features. You can do this for you know, 50 examples and a million features. No problem, right? I mean, what it will do is it will select obviously fewer than 50 features, but you know, it'll select, I don't know, whatever, 10. And so the idea is that, that that's a heuristic for getting you out of trying all 1 million choose 10. Uh, sets of 10 features. So it does feature selection for you. OK. Um, so that's the problem. Um, you can write a, a sparse direct solver for it, and it works you know, exactly as advertised. Everything, they all look like this, right? It takes 30 steps or whatever to get it, gets you a perfectly good solution. And this shows you how much, uh, how much it, it depends on the uh, value of lambda. And direct methods, as I said, are essentially independent of the data. And that's true. So instead of taking you know, 32 steps, it takes 33 or something like that. And this would be, I guess these are just two examples. Um, and the, each of these has a few thousand variables and constraints. Um, and these are solved relatively fast. We'll go to a, a much bigger problem um, with maybe, I don't know, three quarters of a million features, 11,000 examples. So here's an example where you have a whole lot more features than you have examples. Um, and you have about 5 million non-zeros in the data. Um, and the interior point method compatible, it, the final IPM problem you, has about a million and a half variables and so on. Um, these are way beyond the capability of direct methods. Um, so this is with a relatively simple preconditioner for a Newton system. You can solve this in just a couple of, of minutes. And this would be the, uh, this is what this would look, look like. Um, now what's really weird, now here you see all sorts of, you see everything you'd expect for one of these methods. Um, but the first thing you see is the actual time, which is measured by cumulative PCG iterations. It's actually data dependent. Um, actually, what's interesting is as a practical matter, you're only interested in this one. Because the sparser the, sparser the final selected features are, the faster it is. Um, so it turns out you're really only interested in that. And really, for machine learning, you don't care about duality gaps at 10 to the minus 7. You never no, of course you don't. No, 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 you could go out here. Yeah, yeah so, so in fact, you could have stopped out here. I agreed completely, right? Because the whole thing's a heuristic for just actually making a classifier. So, so it, if, judged by, if you judged it by 
on a, on a validation set, you would find that if you, if you stopped probably like right here, those weights would do just fine. And just truncated the ones that were clearly going towards zero to zero, I'm sure it worked fine. So, okay. So, all right. Um, I, these are kind of obvious, um, but the point is these methods will take you up to the 10 million variable uh, problem. It's here, uh, pretty straightforward, yeah. Now, uh, by the way, there are first order methods that people have now developed for these, and these are also quite good. They're the same thing, they're, basic, they're almost linear, uh, same as these, and so those are quite good. So, actually, that's sort of my theory, is that if you have a specific problem, um, and you make an interior point method, you'll, a custom interior point method, it will be the first in to get to be really, really fast. Then the crowds will sort of come in and they'll, make, they'll end up with some simple first order variable at a time method. And with a lot of tuning, these things will work. Um, that's happened for a lot of uh, L1 regularized problems. And, and th those are perfectly good methods. But of course, all we have to do is make a variation on the problem, add some linear inequalities, <laughs> something like that. And, uh, and, and those other methods don't work. But it, but anyway, okay. Um, so the summary here is just that um, you, there's really sort of these three regimes of, of problem solving. Ones that go, and I'm talking now, I'm not talking on a, on a distributed, we didn't talk about distributed solvers, but we talked about just, you know, a traditional solver on one machine, multi-core, it doesn't matter, but just one machine. And there are these three regimes, the small problems, the medium, and the super big. Okay. All right, last thing I want to talk about, it's going to be pretty brief. Um, actually, I find it actually kind of really interesting because actually I have no idea what it can be used for, but I know something because it's, it's just really cool, and it's this. So let's imagine that you're going to solve a specific problem, right? So, um, and actually to kind of get this, to figure the idea here, let, let's make it a mo you know, modest size problem, a couple of hundred variables, let's say. So you could make it a portfolio optimization problem or an optimal execution problem in finance or a problem in control, network flow. Let's just make it network flow. Let's just, you have a network, you want to decide the flow rates of 100 flows passing over 300 links. And you want to, you want to set these flow rates. Um, so, I mean, that's way beyond. No, no one just messing around, not trained in optimization, could, you know, could come up with something even remotely uh, close to optimal. Um, okay, but when you, if you're making a custom solver like this, for, you can exploit the structure very efficiently. And the cool part is you can do this, um, you can actually do this at code, gener at, at code time, code generation time. You don't do it at runtime. So solvers now generally work like this. You, it, it reads in the data. It takes some time to analyze the sparsity. It, it uses whatever method it uses to uh, generate some permutations. At that point, it knows how bad the fill-in is going to be. It allocates some memory for it, maybe some extra memory for dynamic uh, pivoting and stuff like that. And then it starts solving the problem. That's how, they, that's how a solver works now. And that's great. That's kind of how you want a general purpose solver to work. But here I'm talking about something where you're going to solve, you want to optimize the flows on this network. Topology is known or something like that ahead of time. You can spend hours figuring out good permutations. You can also do things like determine all the orderings and do the memory allocation. Even you can move things around in memory for nice, you know, locality of reference and all that. You can do crazy stuff. Um, you can also cut corners in the algorithm. So as you just pointed out, you don't have to, if you write a general purpose solver, you better make it get six or eight digits of accuracy because you don't know what, you know, you don't know what people are going to use it for, right? So if it's finance or something like that or who knows, it's something like that where the six or eighth digit actually has meaning. Uh, probably means the problem was scaled wrong, but that's another story. But then you, you just don't know. But if, if once you have a particular problem, it's very rare that the second digit actually, in a properly scaled problem, third digit is utterly inconsequential in almost all practical problems, as far as I know. Uh, completely inconsequential. Um, so once you have a specific problem, you can terminate way early. You can use warm start. Because if you, if you have something in a sort of a real-time embedded thing where you solve one problem, then another, then another, it's often the case that these problems are related and they're very close. And you can use warm start. Now, if you, if you put all these tricks together, you can end up with a very fast solver. And this basically opens up the possibility of real-time embedded convex optimization. So this is, uh, this is this. And I'll just look at some quick examples here. Here's grass force optimization. 
Um, so this is uh, for a robot. You have a, a rigid body, and there are fingers grasping it, and you have to decide the forces on, on, the fin on, on these fingers. Um, they have to resist a given, uh, there's a wrench, there's a, a force and a torque on the body. You have to resist that. That's this. That's six equations. And you have to satisfy the friction cone constraints, except I forgot to put in the coefficient of friction, which is either, I guess it goes one of these two places. You put the coefficient of friction in there. It doesn't matter. Um, OK. So you, know, you could say, oh, that's horrible. It's non-differentiable, which it is. That's fine. But we're past that stage. So we just say it's an SOCP. Um, and in this case, for example, if you exploit the sparsity pattern and various other things, and you have a custom method for calculating a dual point and all these kinds of things, um, you can solve these problems here in around 80 microseconds. So um, the speed up, by the way, compared to sort of one of these other things, 80 microseconds is a joke uh, compared to these other things have just pulled in the problem. They're just sort of waking up and thinking about finding an ordering and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And this is done. Um, OK, so 300 microseconds is cold start. That's just from nothing. That's just new data. Never saw it before. You get the answer. Okay. So we've done this now on a bunch of problems. Um, another one is model predictive control. I don't know if people know about this. Do people know about this? This is very, very cool. It's widely used. So you have a, a stochastic control problem. Let's make it linear for simplicity. So you have, so it could just actually be a supply chain problem. Just make it, let's do supply chain. So you have a bunch of product of a bunch of nodes on a, on a graph. And at each step, you can ship things along nodes at certain costs. Okay? You can even pull some in from a factory or something like that. Um, and you have demands at various nodes and that things that get pulled out. And there are different models of it. But one would be, for example, that you could actually allow the, the stock at a certain point to go negative, that would be back order. I mean, you, you could have all sorts of games. But now, and you have a, what you know is the distribution of demands. It's statistical. Um, and so the question is now, how do you operate a, a real-time supply chain this way? So you know your stock everywhere, um, and what, you know, how do you do this? These are very complicated stochastic control problems, but there's some really amazingly good heuristics. Um, one is MPC, and it, it just works like this. It's, you plan, you plan over a horizon. You just take 20 steps in the future. Now in the future, of course, you don't know the demands. So you go to an expert and you ask them to guess the demands. It's that you could use the conditional mean based on what you know so far. I mean, it, it just doesn't even matter. You get, you get that. You pretend that's exactly what's going to happen. And you work out a complete planning trajectory of how you'd ship things across nodes to minimize you know, shipping cost, warehousing cost, and you know, some cost associated with uh, back ordering and all that kind of stuff. So you just you'd work out a whole plan and you'd execute only the first step. Right? So it's got lots of names. It's also called um, rolling horizon planning, dynamic linear programming. It's got lots of names. Um, works unbelievably well. Um, it is now universally used in chemical process engineering. So that happened in the 80s, um, 80s and 90s. So that's how that works. The problem with it is, I mean, the reason it was there is because in, a, in chemical processes, the dynamics are very slow, and you have 15 minutes or an hour to make your new decisions. Things are just going very, very slowly. So no problem. You can solve a 50,000 variable LP quite reliably in that amount of time. So most people in control assumed, oh, they would call that, oh, that's a numerical method. You know, I work on like jet fighters or blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I make uh, servos for uh, disk drives. I need to update my, you know, I, have to, I need to make my decision not every hour. I make my decision every uh, 50 microseconds. So this will never apply to me anyway. Um, that's not right. Um, and these are actually just very old numbers here. So this is uh, just model predictive control. Uh, just to point to one here, would be a, this, this would be the types of thing people would actually use. So this would be a QP with 50 variables, 160 constraints. Um, and if you exploit all the structure, you get solve times of 300 microseconds. Actually, these are off. These are now down to like 150 and things like that. And this is just on some like 2 gigahertz processor or something like that. Um, and the typical speed up you would get, they're typically on the order of 1,000 to 1 compared to, these are already very 
uh, th these are already sort of the uh, extremely good interior point methods. But it's not fair, right? Because these things have solved a thousand of these problems before these things, these things are just waking up, allocating memory, loading, uh, loading, starting to have a discussion about what the ordering of the variables should be. And these things have done a thousand, have solved a thousand problems. So, but it's not, it's of course not a fair comparison, but that's it. Okay. So actually, um, I actually, I, this I think is really interesting. It's what I'm sort of interested in most right now is, because uh, it seems that there's this whole regime in optimization. Everyone thinks of optimization as either solving giant problems, uh, something like that, or solving things you know, with a human in the loop on a human time scale. With somebody with a spreadsheet types in some what if and hits you know, optimize it or some stupid thing like that and all of a sudden something happens and it has to happen in a second or two. If it's a giant problem and it takes 15 minutes or an hour, that's cool if you're like, working out the scheduling for United Airlines for tomorrow, that's, that's, that's what people expect. Um, what I haven't seen is a lot of interest or any focus on solving convex optimization problems in microseconds and milliseconds, which now we know is absolutely possible. Um, I don't know what to do with it. So actually, if anybody here has any ideas, like for example, suppose you could knock off a, suppose you can knock off, I mean here, suppose you can knock off a, an L1 regularized logistic regression you can update the W's every two milliseconds. I don't know. But for some modest size problem. I'm trying to think, I don't know what to do with that. But I'm sure there's going to be something cool you can do with that. That, that, that much I'm, I'm, I'm confident of. So, okay. So maybe I'll, I'll quit here. Um, the references, that's what Google is for. So I won't say anything about that. So. And I'll, I'll quit here. Algebra, a linear uh, optimization of a billion variables. How many exabytes did he need for memory? Oh, it was some. It was huge. Um, he used some giant, uh, like the blue gene thing. One of these huge, huge things. Um, so, oh, each 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 iteration took. I think he told me it was something like. I think it was like uh, it was hours. It was like two oh, hours. Two days. Like the memory requirements. It was what? So we can do the arithmetic. It was a couple of hours. Yeah. Two hours was each iteration. But the memory is n squared. That's the reason. You don't know, no, but it was a room. He showed a picture of it in a slide. I mean, it was like you could see way off in the distance. There were machines there. So, <laughs> this, the, yeah, it, it wasn't on a. I wonder if that was the world's largest dense matrix computation. I don't know. He he says it's not, but but it but it was pretty big. So. Anyway, you can find that out. It's Gonzio. Uh, so just type, Gonzio. yeah, Jack Gonzio in, Jack and you'll—I'm sure you'll find that. Yeah. So, good. Even more awesome. Yeah. At the end of October, you still uh, have the courage to talk about financial optimization. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, I can tell you this actually: a, a lot of the stuff in convex optimization is used for robust portfolio optimization. Oh. <laughs> so. I actually think that the status of the people who are talking about robust portfolio optimization actually has risen substantially. Uh, so, because before that, you'd hear people, I'd talk to people who were actually in the trenches fighting other people, you know, my method, your method, and all that. And they would say no things. What your algorithm is, if you yeah. don't have the right data, they were doing things like calculating risk on mortgage portfolios using three year old data for Good point. Mortgage, mortgage characteristics that no longer exist. Yep. So. Okay. Good. Okay.